all the business. Let's get down to why we're all really here. And that's to hear the amazing Phil Brown, who happens to be an expert birder, a fabulous educator, a great guy to work with, and just generally an incredible naturalist. And we're all so lucky that tonight he's going to be taking us on a tour through the raptors of our region so that we can all get ready to see the greatest show above earth, as I've heard other people refer to it. So Phil, take it away. Okay, thank you, Susie, for that warm introduction. Um, I uh, appreciate everybody making some time tonight to learn about migratory raptors and how to best enjoy them. Um, so my role at the Harris Center for the past several years has been a hawk watch coordinator. Um, so what I do is uh, coordinate the, the Pacman Adnock Raptor Observatory, which is a, a 17 year running uh, raptor migration research facility, an outdoor classroom, uh, a place that reaches about 5,000 visitors in person each year, and uh, so many more uh, in other ways, such as the virtual realm now. Um, so it's, uh, it's great to um, give you guys a heads up as to what you might be seeing literally looking looking up in the next couple of weeks as we approach the peak of raptor migration um, so just a quick sound check Susie can you hear me really well perfect okay good let me know if anything goes out and we'll try to do our best to get back um, so yeah I've been uh, I'll say my my time as a hawk watcher goes way back to when I was a kid uh, traveling uh, on long family car trips down to Florida uh, and seeing raptors along the roadside, always being fascinated as to what they were. Most of the time they were probably red-tailed hawks, but I had a, a list a mile long as to how many species that I thought I was seeing anyway. Um, but you know, the more you know, the more you, you know how to improve upon your identifications. And maybe that's some of the reason some of you are here today, uh, but I'll try to go over a little bit about a lot of things about the 15 species of raptors that we might see over the Monadnock region of uh, New Hampshire. Um, so depending on where you are, you're probably seeing a lot of these hawks too on the East Coast, um, but many of the same species can be found on the West Coast and other parts of the world. And I'll show you and um, prove to you how raptors really connect our worlds. A few uh, questions that I'll pose for tonight's program. Um, the screen, excuse me. Um, what is our role in New Hampshire in monitoring migratory hawks? Um, you know, where are they going? How are they doing? Um, and, uh, and quite a bit more. So first thing we'll have to cover is what exactly is a raptor? Um, so the most basic definition for the birds that we see that we can classify as raptors are these are the ones that have killing talons like that fearsome looking occipiter young hawk on the bottom there with its sharp long claws, uh, killing talons for, for grabbing rodents, snakes, birds, uh, all sorts of smaller critters. And generally that covers the eagles, ospreys, kite, harrier, which is represented by one species here, uh, the hawks like the red-tailed and the broad-winged hawk, um, and owls, which, um, which are of course nocturnal mostly. Um, and for these purposes, we also consider falcons raptors and vultures, which are not truly raptors, but we do uh, consider them uh, as migratory birds of prey. Um, they're kind of honorary because they, they fit into that category well, and I'll explain to you why. So a little bit about migration monitoring. So effectively the, the long-term Migration monitoring at hawk watch sites around the world is really the best way to measure population size uh, of raptors because um, because of their habits. Raptors are, are pretty um, secretive a lot of the time during the day. Their nests are hard to find, so they're hard to detect in the summer. Um, they can be hard to detect in the winter. Um, when they're flying in migration, that's the chance to, to tally them in a systematic way. Um, so, so hawk watching goes back um, many decades uh, with the founding of Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania. That was the first location in the East that, um, that started a, a standardized long-term count. Um, and there's a, there's a real need for migration monitoring uh, because globally over half of raptor species have declined and now about one fifth are threatened with extinction. And uh, that includes, um, uh, the threats include losing native habitat, which is a big one, 
collisions with power lines, buildings, windows, um, poisoning both inadvertently and uh, and intentionally. Uh, development of energy at a at a pace that's not sustainable with, uh, with how wildlife can respond and um, unsustainable practices of uh, land management as well. Uh, and now we also worry about climate change being a major factor. And um, the more research that's conducted, the more we realize how true that seems to be. That many raptors are suffering because of um, both long-term and 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 short-term weather-related events. Um, and an excellent uh, gateway bird and, um, and a hook into uh, the conservation world. You know, it, it's fun. Uh, connecting with raptors is, is a lot of fun and it, it engages people of all ages, uh, but it really especially is such a hook for, for younger kids because um, they want to see something up close and, and raptors can be can be uh, a creature that you can interact with much more easily than a, a sparrow in the brush, perhaps, or or something uh, that's small and further away. Raptors are big, and sometimes, especially when they're in migration, they can really be right over your heads. Um, so they're they're fascinating, and they've um, provided us with endless fascination. So the the photo on the bottom right, if you can't make out what that scene is, um, this speaks to the history of uh, the threats to the raptors, even in our part of the world. These are raptors that were slaughtered really just for fun, just for target practice. Uh, raptors were long considered uh, vermin, and um, there were even bounties on shooting raptors in certain states. So, um, so gunners would go out at, at the high lookout points, places like Pacman Adnock uh, and Hawk Mountain, and um, just knock them out of the sky. Uh, so this was a scene from Hawk Mountain in the early days of the protection of that sanctuary in the 1930s. There are, are almost 200 actively um, migration monitoring sites that are active now. Um, there's a network that's expanding uh, quite considerably throughout the Western Hemisphere. It really started in the Northeast, and that is a big reason why there are so many white specks on this map here that you can see. So the white specks, the white dots are hawk watch sites. Um, there are uh, a, a few more in autumn than there are in the spring, but, um, but there's seasonality for um, for both seasons. Um, and in our area, in the ridges and valleys of um, the Northeast, fall is really the better time uh, away from the coast to really see a concentration of migratory raptors. So a few of these sites have been monitoring for a long time, like several decades. And at this point, Pacman Adnock is uh, kind of a middle-aged hawk watch. Um, it's getting up to uh, uh, near its 20th year. Um, hey. But yeah, the, the expansion of sites all throughout into South America is is quite exciting. So we're learning a lot more because of that network. Hi, Phil. Um, okay, so um, there's a, a, a tool that conservation biologists use that was developed um, uh, a couple of, uh, about a decade ago uh, called the Raptor Population Index. And um, this tool helps managers, uh, Raptor Population Index tool helps biologists track raptor populations. And Pacman Adnock is one of the 65 sites that was included in the recent data analysis. So I'll, I'll refer to this analysis when I talk about some of the population changes that we see with each raptor uh, species. So the list of the partners at the bottom here, you can see um, uh, various hawk research partners involved in this effort. Um, so generally what we're finding out is uh, in the East Coast, these are some of the trends for what we're seeing, increasing, decreasing, and birds that are kind of holding their own population-wise. And this speaks to the trends, uh, the migration trends specifically. So you can see uh, what's alarming here is the, the list of decreasing is, is quite a lot bigger than, than the list of species increasing, only a few species that have had concerted efforts to really help their populations rebound. Um, so we're starting to grow a little bit concerned about what's going on with some of these hawks and long-term studies are initiated and uh, the findings are showing that uh, it's really a mixed bag and um, some of these threats are species specific. So a little bit about how and where to look. Uh, the fall migration is, is most pronounced on days with lighter winds that come from the north or the west or a little bit northwest especially. Um, days following cold fronts. So. Once that air changes, like a couple of days ago, a cold front came through, 
things cooled off, the hawks will follow those winds because it's energy efficient for them to move uh, on the winds that are carrying them in the direction they're going, south and west. Uh, Mid-September to mid-October is the peak for the most species and the largest numbers in our area. But there's a slightly different timetable for every species that passes through, and that depends on food availability and conditions. For example, bald eagles are one of the last species to be still migrating in the in the fall because they uh, they like to hang out near open water. And when when rivers and lakes start to freeze in late fall, that will really get some of the eagles migrating south. And a few tips on how to see them. Uh, raptors utilize thermals, which are these rising pockets of warm air, uh, and up updrafts, which are winds that deflect up the slope on ridges and mountains. So Pacman Adnock being a 22 mile long ridge line uh, located along that ridge line um, is really an excellent vantage point because of its height, and the views, um, and also because of how the winds hit off that ridge and give the raptors lift right over our heads. Um, I talked about the weather and winds a little bit. Um, and uh, there's a, a resource that, that I'll put up at the end again, hawkcount.org, which is an excellent resource to uh, get your, your migration forecast, kind of like a weather forecast for, for hawks the next day. And on to the site itself, Pacman Adnock. I'm guessing several of you have been up there. Uh, this is a project that was founded by New Hampshire Audubon in 2004 and has been uh, conducted at Miller State Park. Uh, so New Hampshire Parks is a key partner and New Hampshire Audubon is a key partner. The Harris Center staffs the project uh, with myself and um, this uh, fall is the third fall for Levi, Levi Burford, who's pictured here. He's the raptor biologist again this season. Uh, so he's up there five days a week and we have a team of volunteers to help fill the gaps uh, in coverage. Uh, it's a fun place to watch hawks and, uh, and are, has become a, a real community for, for uh, bird watchers and hawk watchers and, and just members of the general public who want to learn more. It's a very welcoming and inclusive site, so uh, we encourage everybody to check it out. And it can get crowded, so I should put in the public service announcement that you must make reservations in order to guarantee your spot um, with, uh, with Miller State Park. So go on to their their online resource to make a reservation, especially for a busy weekend, you're gonna need that reservation to access the park. But this site is free and open to the public once you pay your way to the park. Um, and uh, we always have uh, volunteers and staff who are willing to, to talk with visitors and give them education on site and point out birds. So um, come up and learn about the raptors with us. Um, uh, last fall, we, we got our friend Eric Masterson back up, uh, another hawk uh, hawk lover um, and Harris Center staff member uh, after uh, he had an accident last year and got him back out to the site. So that's what that photo shows. Uh, typically most falls, there's a raptor release day, uh, which is an exciting event, especially for, uh, well, the kids and all of us, I should say, um, uh, when rehabilitated raptors are released and uh, put on a show very briefly, usually over the crowd. Last year, due to COVID, we had to get creative and we came up with a, a system to help people stay socially distanced. Um, and uh, oh, thanks. So we have a, a corral system in place and uh, to continue and get the entire season in. Uh, so it was nice to have that continuity with data and the park and, and our staff really did everything we could to keep everybody safe. and. Um, we had an excellent season as a result. This year, um, the, uh, the, the distancing factor continues, um, but it's, it's more self-imposed now. We don't have the, the corral system, um, but uh, I was up there on, on Monday counting raptors and yeah, we did see a few broadwing talks coming through. So this is what we see on the average season. Um, the star of the show by far is this broadwing hawk that I've mentioned a couple of times. Uh, over three quarters of the, the entire tally is comprised of this one species. And most of them are going to pass within a very condensed window of time, such as a week or two. 
And that happens every year in the middle of September 11th and the 24th, we are gonna see thousands of broadwing hawks. Um, on average, we, we see about 8,500 of them in the course of the season. And that's what helps give us our, our total of averaging over 11,000 birds a year. The second most abundant species is the sharp shinned hawk, which um, has a different way of migrating. They're more in ones and twos, whereas the broadwing hawk comes, comes together in groups of over a hundred or sometimes several hundred birds. Um, the other 13 species make up the other 13%. So you get an idea of um, uh, the diminishing returns as we pass broadwing hawk season. But it's still exciting every day. And, uh, and that's some about the qualitative elements of the project um, rather than the numbers. It's the, the interaction that we get, the close sightings. I'll get to the photos shortly. Uh, so just throwing this slide up here to show uh, an average season, the column in the middle, uh, species by species, that's the, the average tally over uh, 16 years now. Um, and last season's total on the right column. Um, so typically uh, 11,300 birds on average. We've had as many as almost 20,000 on a very good broadwing talk year and as few as about six or 7,000 in the early years. Um, and a few trends uh, I highlighted in, in red were um, low counts and, and a few in uh, blue on the right column were significantly high counts for, for that season. So you might think, well, what's so hard about this, right? It's a bald eagle, obviously. It even has a band on its left leg. Um, but in general, Hawk watching is a little bit more challenging like this. The identification is based on less so of features like the white head and the white tail that we, that we all know belong to the bald eagle. But um, some of the other elements such as uh, their behavior, how they flap, do they flap slowly flat as a, a two by four? Um, can you pick up any coloration or patterning on the bird? Um, usually the white head and white tail are, are only visible in, in decent light at a, a fairly close distance. Um, and are they, are they solo or are they in groups? So um, going, th few, going through a few of those, we can generally break up some of the species into these size categories to start with. Um, so this is more or less to scale with eagles being the largest by far. Um, vultures would fit in in between eagles and budios, um, as would ospreys, which have a, about a a five or six foot wingspan themselves. Eagles have about a seven and a half foot wingspan uh, for a big female. So that's a massive bird. Um, so taking that down to the, the smallest of the falcons and sharp shinned hawks, um, the wingspan is, is closer to two feet. So you can see how um, there's quite a range of sizes and shapes too. We, we sell um, popular raptor silhouette guides on Pacman Adnoc, uh, which are laminated and um, it's a great way to just kind of have something wherever you are and um, trying to figure out what some of these silhouettes are as you're seeing them up in the sky. So it's a good resource. So here's an example of the size. Um, it's hard to tell size when you're looking in the sky at a bird. It, um, sometimes uh, a tiny little speck through binoculars can end up being a, a butterfly or a dragonfly. And sometimes it can be a plane 50 miles away. It's incredible how the size is so hard to judge and you need to look at other things. Uh, so here we have two obviously raptors. Uh, the one on the right uh, is a red-tailed hawk, uh, which you might say doesn't have a red tail. How, how is that a red-tailed hawk? So um, young red-tailed hawks, as I'll mention a few slides in, uh, do not have the red tail in their first year of life. So they, they grow those feathers in in year two um, and their tails appear longer uh, and young, young birds generally have longer wing feathers and flight feathers or um, tail feathers. The bird on the left is a sharp shinned hawk, one of the, the most ferocious and tiny little hawks. So obviously some size difference there. Um, the species on this screen, uh, the species on this screen is, is actually the same species. Um, and looking at the two, there's some obvious plumage color differences on the underside. Um, but what you do notice about these is they have a relatively similar wing shape, the way these two birds are holding their wings slightly angled forward. 
the tail is a uh, fairly similar length. The wings bow out in the middle. These are all telltale field marks at a hawk watch that we're looking at a red shouldered hawk. Um, the difference is the bird on the left with its striking uh, reddish orange underneath and even more striking red on top that you don't see. Uh, and the black and white contrasting tail and, and wings too, um, that, that plumage is attained uh, in adult plumage. So that, that takes um, until the second year for the red-shouldered hawk to look that way. Uh, on the right, this is a young red-shouldered red hawk. Um, generally, young birds have streaking going from head to tail. So in the direction of head to tail, there are some uh, lines or series of dots that lead uh, in that direction. Whereas adult birds have more of a barring going across the chest and across the belly, going from wingtip to wingtip. So um, tail differences are, are also notable here because of the, the fine banding on the, the youngster. So color pattern, very important. Um, species behavior, and are they solo or do they go in groups? Uh, this, this photo speaks to this. These are all pretty much the same species. These are broad-winged hawks, uh, similar to a, a kettle that we might see sometime in the next week at Pacman Adnock. Um, so waiting for the next couple of cold fronts to start seeing our first uh, broad wings gather up in, in numbers of, of more than five or 10. Uh, but it's, it's bound to happen like it does every year. So now I'll jump in and go through species by species. And I'll start with the families or with the, the subfamilies here. Um, Buteos is a group of raptors. Uh, so I'll start here. All right, so Buteos um, are typically raptors that are medium to large sized. Uh, they're, they're typically fairly chunky. And we think of these as the kind of your average hawk. Um, what people mostly think of as hawks. Uh, Buteo usually comes to mind. It's, uh, they have generally shorter tails that are kind of broad and fanned out when they're soaring, uh, long, broad wings. And these birds behaviorally rely on thermals, those pockets of warm air. And that's given them the, the nickname, the wind masters, uh, dubbed by, by uh, uh, raptor expert Pete Dunn um, and his resource Hawks. Hawks in Flight, uh, Pete Dunn, uh, Sibley, and um, Clay Sutton authored that book uh, many decades ago. It's still a classic and um, an important uh, resource for every serious hawk watcher. I'll, um, I'll put that one up at the end too. Um, so so in the bird in this photo is a young red-tailed hawk. Uh, a couple of their key field marks. The key field mark on a red-tailed hawk in just about every season and every age is uh, this, what we call a belly band or a belt. It often looks like um, uh, a, a series of, of streaks really centered in the middle of the bird's belly. So it's, it's given that belly band name or belt appearance. They also have these darker brown markings near the head um, called the patagial area, patagials. Um, so dark patagials, belly band. Big broad wings, they have about a four foot wingspan. Um, and these are the hawks you see most of the time uh, along the highways, um, uh, along with turkey vultures, which do a lot of soaring over, over highways. Red-tailed hawks do a lot of hunting along highways and roadsides, uh, especially in, in larger interstates. Um, and unfortunately they, they get hit by cars quite a bit because of that, um, but they're swooping down looking for, for mice and other rodents in the median. Here's the typical classic adult plumage of the red-tailed hawk that they get in, in year two. Another field mark here, which is very helpful at times, is seeing the, uh, the wing tips, uh, also called the primary feathers, are slightly uh, pointed upward. And especially when they're head on and they're hovering or kiting, um, red-tailed hawks do a lot of kiting. Uh, it's a key behavior of theirs. Um, and, uh, and that's a great giveaway that we're seeing red-tailed hawks, even from Several miles away, we see a bird that kind of pulls up into a, into a, a steep, uh, almost like a pre-diving look, um, pulling up and then starting to hover its wings with its wings up above it. It's actually seeing prey on the ground, um, many hundreds or even thousands of feet down below because they have this incredible vision. Red-tailed box, when do we see them? 
Um, and how many do we see? Typically, we're seeing between uh, two and 400 these days. The numbers are definitely trailing off uh, at both pack. Um, so for each, each of these slides for each Raptor, I prepared um, a graph showing um, the, uh, the number here over the years. So from 2006 to 2019, um, that's, that's the actual number observed at pac Monadnock. Um, and this is the RPI, the Raptor Population Index line, which shows this, this line graph trend, um, which is, is going down by about 7.4% per year over this period of time. Uh, so declining in the east and declining at pac Monadnock, but there is more of a story to why they're declining. And I, I can't get into all of that now, but this will be a teaser for you to come back on November 30th to see my next program about what we do know and what we don't know about raptors and um, why we need to know more. Um, that's not the title, but Susie can post something about that later probably. Yeah, red-tailed hawks declining, but oh yeah, when do they come through? These are late season migrants. If you wanna see red-tailed hawks in migration, October, late October into early November, uh, that's the best window for seeing many, including sometimes up to 70 or more a day. Um, so that's, that's pretty neat when you, you see that many coming through. Red-shouldered hawk, as the same photo I showed earlier, the wings arching forward. Um, Red-shouldered is, is a little bit less common in general in New Hampshire. Um, they're birds of uh, denser, wetter woodlands. And we do have quite a few in this area, in the Monadnock region. I, I found a nest near the Harris Center uh, this summer. So I, I know they're, uh, they're nesting uh, you know, regionally in probably you know, most most towns, or, or maybe all towns in the state, um, they are they're around, but you don't see them as much because of their their habits. They're they like to inhabit the swampy areas and um, wet woodlands, so it's a little bit harder to get to their their nesting territory. But they do have a, a high pitched shrieking call that they'll give over and over, uh, keer keer keer, kind of sound. So you might be hearing that this time of the year as they get ready to migrate as well. And, and as the youngsters are starting to call more. Um, they're a little smaller than red-tailed hawks, uh, a little bit sleeker, the body's not as bulky, um, and, and slightly longer tailed. So, um, so these two at a hawk watch, red-tailed and red-shouldered, it's a tricky ID from a distance. Um, it takes some time getting used to it, but they do have a, a flight profile that's slightly different and the way they hold their wings and, and the frequency of their flapping can be another clue. So we're looking at some really subtle field marks that you really have to hone over time to really get these down. Um, you know, it, it takes a long time to really get good at identifying these. Here's a, a, a similar looking bird in general, but there's a trick here. I'm, I'll, um, anybody in the chat want to put in the chat what you think this bird is? Crow, raven. Okay. Those well, are the William, guesses. William got it. Um, it is, raven. This is a common raven. Yep. So good guesses. Yeah. And, and saying the wedged tail, it has a very rounded tail. This is one of the honorary raptors at the Hawk Watch. Um, we see a lot of these on a daily basis. Um, and they're, uh, they're very similar in size to the Buteos. And they often fly with them. So they can be uh, confused very easily. Uh, but ravens also show a big bill that is often hanging open and a pretty big pronounced head too. So they have this big, long, rounded tail, uh, long wings, the big head, and they're, they're very jet black. Um, so generally, if you see a bird that you can say decidedly is jet black, it's not going to be a hawk. Um, it's either a crow or a raven, most likely. And oh yeah, maybe this is a good chance to mention Susie and I are going to be talking about crows and ravens in October, right around Halloween. So you could tell us more about that later, maybe. Uh, red-shouldered hawks, unlike red-tailed hawks, we're seeing more red shoulders as the years go on. It might come to the time where these numbers intersect and we have about the same number of red shoulders as we have red tails. Uh, but they're increasing at about 4.6% per year. And in the East, they are stable. Uh, and in some places increasing. Um, so uh, climate change could be one of the reasons we're seeing more red shoulders uh, as 
Uh, maybe conditions become more suitable to their nesting. This is generally a southern raptor. Um, and, and there is evidence in more recent years that they're expanding their range north into parts of northern New England and elsewhere. So, um, so good news for us. We'll be seeing more red-shouldered hawks. And now broad-winged hawk, uh, a bird with uh, similar, vaguely similar to this red-shouldered hawk. Look at the tail banding. There's, um, you can see lots of black and white tail banding on a red-shouldered hawk. Broad-winged has two prominent white bands going across the tail in adult plumage. And the rest are um, you know, the black that bisects those bands. Um, this is an adult bird, which has the barring going across the chest. Um, and uh, their, their wings, their wingtips are different. They're a little bit shorter, a little more compact um, compared to the, the four foot wingspan of red shouldered and red tailed hawk. Broad wings have more of a three foot wingspan on average, but they're still you know, fairly sizable, chunky birds with those, those thick wings and often fanned out tails. And youngsters have the streaking again from head to tail. Um, the wingtips come to a what we call a candle flame appearance, uh, almost like a, a very defined tip here. The third and fourth primaries um, really come out to a tip where it's almost a pointed wing compared to the rounded appearance of the other beautios. So we're about to see lots of these guys, both youngsters and adults mixing in. And their numbers, uh, we've had to create some new numbers here on, on this chart to get up to the 16,000 that we've seen in one season. Um, but generally, uh, they're remarkably stable. Um, only about a 1% change over the 14-year data set here. That's remarkably similar. Even though we've had some majorly you know, high years and low years, we're generally seeing about the same number year after year. And that's the case for a lot of sites in the East as well. Even though um, uh, you know, we know that, that there are threats for broadwing hawks too. We'll talk more about those in my November talk. Um, you can have this happen. If you just hit it just right, you can see this many hawks in the sky above your head. Um, this particular photo I think was taken in Texas where the numbers build even more so, but we have seen uh, over 5,000 in one day from Pac-Man ad um, And on the average year, there'll be two or three days at least where we see a thousand or more and those days are coming right up so make your reservations get up to that mountain and oh yeah so we have a new broad-winged hawk project a monitoring project that the harris center uh, has launched in 2020 um, and in this past summer we partnered with hawk mountain out of pennsylvania to monitor nests of uh, broad wings in the region we found nine nests collectively with uh, myself and a, a team of volunteers. Um, we, uh, we've monitored these nests all summer long, and we were able to trap five of these birds, affixing transmitters to three of them, uh, like this, um, like this little backpack backpack unit on the bird on the right. Um, so three birds, uh, two of them now are sending us signals. We don't know the fate of the third transmitter. It may have it may have failed. Um, but we have uh, migration maps. And by the way, this is a, a chick here that's just about ready to fledge on the left here from uh, a nest on Prospect Hill in Hancock. Yeah, there's a question from um, William. He was wondering if broadwing hawks have the darkest malar stripe. And for those of us that don't know what a malar stripe is, maybe you could tell us that as well. Sure, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, compared to the others, yeah, red-shouldered hawk has a, more of a smooth, darker face in general, um, with with not much contrast. Going to um, the adult broadwing hawk, there's a lot of dark. The malar is, is typically like the the mustache area between the uh, the bill and the eye, so this dark area below the eye. Um, and as, as a youngster, yes, definitely as youngsters, they do show a lot of uh, dark. So yeah, good question. Great. One other question. Um, this is from Linda. She's wondering when we can see um, red shoulders hawk, red shouldered hawks migrate mostly. Oh yeah, good question. Um, late October is the best time to see red shoulders migrate. Great. And as, one last, mm -hmm. one last quick question, and then we'll let you go on. Um, 
is what is primarily responsible for the different migration timings across raptor species? And that's from Karen Sieber, our um, ecologist on staff hmm. at the Harris Center. Yeah, good question. Um, it relates to food, most likely. Um, so migration is, is a strategy that has evolved over thousands of years. Um, and it relates to um, following food and, and going from a place of less abundance to more abundance. So that is the primary driver of migration. Um, so you know, broadwing hawks, for example, uh, seem to time their migrations with the development of thermal activity when, um, when the ground is producing the most heat in early fall. So they need to get out of town quickly before our October weather comes in. Um, and they also, there's some connection between uh, broadwing hawks and their food availability. Um, they're uh, largely, well, they, they eat a lot of things such as uh, mammals and birds, but um, they also seem to time their arrival with the amphibian emergence in late mid to late April around here. So there's some thought that they, that may have to do with it. But yeah, it's, it's generally driven by food and um, taking uh, advantage of a food source elsewhere. So yeah, so here is uh, a map, a migration, not a migration map yet, but a pre-migration map of our two broadwinged hawks, uh, Monadnock and Harris, uh, which were um, banded in uh, Dublin and I think Harrisville. Um, no, Dublin and Hancock. Uh, so these two are, are giving signals already and showing how they've been moving around the area. So female bird here on the left during nesting season was only taking very short trips, uh, you know, maybe a kilometer, maybe two away from the nest. Whereas the male here on the right was going several kilometers um, in search of food to bring back to its nest. Um, in, the, in the coming days and weeks, we'll be able to follow these uh, on, um, on the Hawk Mountain tracking website. Um, um, you can follow these live migration maps that Hawk Mountain is going to be producing on their website. I think they're live now. Uh, interestingly, one of our birds uh, after nesting was successful. Our, our female on the nest in Dublin flew north to within two kilometers of the Canada border. Uh, so it went um, you know, hundreds of kilometers north, a couple hundred kilometers. Uh, and this is a pre-migration movement that appears consistent with how other broadwing hawks that have been tagged uh, are moving. But this is the first information we're getting about our New England's broadwing hawks, so the whole population of New England birds. So you know, it's super exciting to be part of this project with Hawk Mountain. And we're, uh, we're planning to do, to do it again next year and uh, potentially put transmitters on even more birds and learn about their wintering range and, uh, and forest habitat and, you know, and have just how they get to where they're going. Some of these broadwings are going as far as southern or central South America uh, in the Amazon rainforest. So that was a, a tangent to hawk watching, but um, uh, getting back to the beautios, there are a couple of other beautios that might show up at some point. Uh, we have had rough legged hawks about half the years. Uh, this is the bird on the upper right. Um, this is a northern bird that nests in the high Arctic and um, moves south for. Uh, for food um, on some, but not every winter, probably. Uh, so some winters we see more rough-legged hawks, but the best place to see these locally in the winter is Plum Island, Massachusetts. If you really want to see a, a rough leg, don't, don't, um, <laughs> you, you might be waiting a long time on Pac-Man Adnock. And on the bottom is an even rarer bird from the West, Swainson's hawk, which is a, a common migrant out West. Uh, which we've recorded twice. Two of the three New Hampshire state records for this species have happened at PAC. Okay, excipiters. These are small to medium-sized birds with generally short round wings and long tails. Um, these birds flap a lot. Um, it takes a lot of work to get where they're going to in general. And as a result, they don't go as far in migration. Uh, the bird pictured here, by the way, is an adult sharp-shinned hawk with a very squared off tail. And, and short head. This is also a sharp shinned hawk, a youngster with the heavy streaking. Um, the, the wings tend to create a bit of an S shape on sharp shinned hawk, which is helpful because it starts with an S. 
so you can remember that. Um, but that uh, this is a very difficult identification to make between the sharp shinned and the Cooper's hawk. Um, we saw that photo earlier. Sharp shinned hawks are very feisty. That's why I threw that one in there. Uh, so sharp shins are second most common species. It is declining at about 2% per year. And it's, uh, it's definitely declining all over the Eastern flyway. And we're trying to figure out reasons. Um, they seem to be fairly sensitive to forest disturbance. Um, these are birds of um, more Northern forests in general and um, you know, coniferous forests. They, they are obviously good predators in your backyard. You see a lot of sharp shinned and Cooper's hawks coming in to take feeder birds, but there may be other factors going on that we're not aware of. Um, it, it could be a, a climate change issue, um, but all we know is something's going on with the species and it's, it's baffling researchers right now. Cooper's hawks is the slightly larger cousin. They have generally straighter wings, especially the leading edge of the wing. Instead of having an S shape, it's more straight at the head. The head protrudes a little further out and the tail is typically more rounded because it has longer central tail feathers. Um, these birds also have a slightly different way of holding their wings because of their size. They, they flap a little less vigorously than the sharp shins, which are constantly flapping really quickly. Um, this bird is showing a, a bulging crop also, which is a feature that we can see on many birds migrating, uh, indicating it just had a meal. So probably just ate a small songbird before this photo was taken, where there's this bump in its throat. The occipiters, so sharp shinned hawks, Cooper's hawks, very similar shape overall. Uh, some of the examples can be even closer than these two uh, because of the way the birds are holding their wings or the angle. And it's, it's really all about getting good long looks. As long as you could observe a bird, try to take in as many field marks as you can when you're seeing it uh, and really putting together a, a, a puzzle based on a series of, of minute observations. Um, so uh, Cooper socks um, generally have a longer tail and some people uh, use the cross shape on a Cooper sock where the, this is the head the top of the cross, the bottom of the cross and, and the uh, left and right side versus a capital T shape of a sharp shinned hawk. But there are always some subtle differences that make um, generalizations hard to stick to. Cooper socks are also declining at the Hawk Watch and in the East, but their decline is probably more tied to them becoming a little less migratory. Uh, at least some populations are sticking around because they have a, a pretty decent food source nearby. Um, so, you know, city pigeons, um, house sparrows, starlings, they, they make a really good food source for these Cooper's hawks, which are becoming uh, very acclimated to human development. So they seem to be doing well in urban areas. And um, we think globally their population is, is doing just fine um, compared to sharp shinned hawks, which may be starting to show some, some real signs of population decline. And get to Northern Goshawk, uh, which is the largest of the occipiter. It has longer wings, uh, up to about a four foot wingspan. Uh, it can be a, a very fierce guardian of its nesting sites. Maybe, maybe some folks here have nesting goshawks near their, their houses. Um, you'll know about it if you do, or if you get too close to their nest, they'll let you know about it. This is an adult, which is very grayish overall, and they have a bold black eye stripe that's hard to see, um, but they're, they're, they have a super stout body, very uh, strong bird built for um, catching large prey and carrying off uh, things like snowshoe hair and roughed grass. So this is a serious northern bird, and um, in our part of the world here, um, we need to know more about how they're doing in the northeast. Um, and this is one I'll talk a lot more about in November, but we do have goshawks nesting in this area um, and, uh, and migrating through. Here's a young goshawk uh, taken by Levi last year, um, showing pretty stout wings, um, vaguely similar to the other occipiters in body shape. So it really takes more than, than just seeing that shape. You need to watch its behavior, see how it moves. Um, they're bigger and bulkier, so they 
they flap a little bit more lethargically and, and powerfully than the other two. And we have seen some spike numbers of goshawks on certain years. They tend to be cyclical in their migrations. So potentially uh, availability or shortages of food will drive their presence through New England as they migrate south into um, the mid-Atlantic states and, and the mountainous regions of the mid-Atlantic. Um, but they don't make that migration every year, um, seemingly only when, when food is scarce. They follow the populations of snowshoe hares, which seem to be on a every other year cycle. Um, so some locations, some hawk watches where there are hundreds of goshawks really show that, that back and forth um, year to year population a little bit more strongly. But we are like much of the East seeing far fewer goshawks than we did just 10 to 15 years ago. Um, so declining big time and another species that is, um, is still fairly poorly understood. Um, research in Pennsylvania and West Virginia is showing that a lot of goshawks that were formerly nesting there are no longer nesting there. Um, they, their determinations about that um, are pointing to factors such as climate change as a possible cause and, and um, maybe invasive, um, invasive tree pests could be a piece of that as um, Hemlock forests are important for their survival. So they're, they're losing about 10% per year. Now we're into the falcons. Um, peregrine falcon pictured here. They're, these are the largest of the falcon. Falcons are generally small to medium size. They have long pointy wings, long tails, and strong flyers. Here's a young peregrine falcon. They have a strongly marked facial features, kind of like it's wearing a helmet, ready for battle. Um, we got to see this on Monday, um, not this particular bird, um, but one uh, peregrine which was sparring with the local ravens and even a cooper's hawk that took a, a dive at the peregrine, but peregrine being the fastest bird in, in the world um, really put those birds to shame and uh, was a lot more, uh, a lot faster and more entertaining to watch. They have increased thanks to many conservation efforts at about 5% per year. Uh, so they're doing quite well. We see about 60 or so. The peak will be sometime in late September, early October. Merlins, um, the medium-sized falcon. It's the darkest of the falcons, very dark bird overall. Um, and it's, it's built for, um, for, for speed and stamina. Um, we're seeing more Merlins overall. As the, the population has increased, building from a, a growing nesting population in Canada, and now they're nesting across parts of New England, including our region. Um, so we're seeing more. Um, these are uh, a, almost a daily occurrence at the Hawk Watch. They spend a lot of time just harassing local birds, maybe uh, spending several days more than just zipping by. We'll see Merlins um, that just like to camp out at the summit and dive at songbirds and bigger birds. They're a lot of fun to watch. American kestrel is the, the daintiest and, and usually the smallest of the falcons and also yeah, the most colorful. Um, male kestrels are different from female kestrels in that they have uh, bluish gray wings um, and uh, compared to just the, the orange body and wings of a, of a female kestrel. So very few raptors have this sexual dimorphism in color uh, but kestrels and harriers do. Um, so we do see kestrels um, in mid to late September is right around their peak. Um, they're very pale underneath. They have the long pointy wings. Um, their, their flight is a little less direct than a Merlin's flight. Otherwise, those two can be confused. Um, putting together the field marks between kestrel and Merlin it usually comes down to behavior as being the, the telltale sign. Here's a, here's a falcon lookalike that was seen on Monday and photographed by, uh, by one of our volunteers, Andre. Um, a great image of two common nighthawks migrating by. And I know they're migrating tonight because I just saw one out of the corner of my eye. Um, so they're, they're moving through the sky tonight. Um, this is a, an exciting species that's not a true hawk, but is vaguely resembles a falcon in flight, uh, similar size and shape and the migration's going on right now in our part of the world. Kestrels though, back to them. Uh, they've 
been declining over the east over over the period of the last couple of decades. However, we seem to see a fairly level number um, on a yearly basis between 150 and 250. Um, we had a record number last year, actually. So that was a good sign of a, a rebound of a bird that we know has lots of threats and, um, and, and risks for um, its survival. Um, I'll skip that for now, but definitely seeing regional declines of kestrels too. Ospreys, large birds. They have a tiny little head. Um, they're very, very eagle-like in size and shape from a distance, but they have a lot of white on their bodies. You'll never see that much white on the body of a bald eagle, whereas we will see white in the wings of a young bald eagle. Um, so ospreys have a noticeable bend at the wrist, gives it kind of a capital M shape, um, mottled belly uh, and uh, dark wrists here, the, the wrist part of the bird these dark areas. They do a lot of soaring and gliding, and occasionally you'll see one of the fish, like um, a volunteer saw one uh, this week at PAC. Ospreys, though, are declining, um, and there are a number of factors associated with that, um, especially the inland birds that are coming from Canada and Maine. Uh, seemingly, they're, they're, they're um, losing territories to the increasing bald eagle. That may be one of the major reasons for their decline in our flyway. Getting towards the end here, Northern Harrier. Uh, it's in its own family for this area. It's about a medium sized bird with a three and a half to four foot wingspan. And they have characteristics of all the birds that we just saw, Budio, Excipiter, and Falcon. They have long angular wings and a long tail. Um, this is a, a young one. Actually, the young ones are, are very golden underneath. Females are brownish and um, the males, here's a female, uh, kind of a mottled brown. They have a very owl-like face, and that relates to, to how they hunt. Um, and uh, they're a very interesting species, state endangered in New Hampshire as a breeding bird. New Hampshire Audubon is study, studying harriers in Coas County way up north, and um, only recorded uh, a few pairs nesting this year in the state. Uh, here's the gray ghost, the male harrier, very striking bird that we see more of them later in the season. Harriers too are declining, about two and a half percent per year. Uh, we know a lot of the reasons they're declining, but we're trying to figure out ways to um, to, to manage for their populations. Uh, down to the eagles here. Uh, this bird needs no introduction. Uh, about a seven and a half foot wingspan. Adult on the right. A young bird on the left. There are about five different plumages for bald eagles because it takes them five years to reach their full adult plumage. So the bird on the left here is, is in its first couple of years of life. Um, let's see, increasing off the charts to over 10% per year. This bird has fully recovered, taken off the endangered species list, um, rebounded um, pretty much all across its range thanks to management efforts and, and bouncing back from the, the toxic DDT. Golden eagles we'll see later in the season in small numbers, uh, usually between five and 10 a year. Um, in late October to early November seems to be the peak for goldens. This is a, a juvenile bird, a youngster showing white at the base of the tail and white in a very particular part of the central tail uh, and also the golden nape of this bird that gives it its name. Massive birds from the north. They used to nest in New Hampshire. Now they're, uh, they haven't for the past uh, 50 years or so. Um, but maybe there's hope for their recovery because we're starting to see a population rebound in the east. There's a small population in, uh, in uh, eastern Canada that totals about two or 3,000 birds. Um, just for scale here, this is a red-tailed hawk, a four-foot wingspan bird chasing this golden eagle. So that's an adult golden eagle, by the way, um, with very little or no white on the body. Uh, but a tiny little head compared to the bald eagle. Golden eagles have a tiny little head. And they often fly with a slight dihedral, meaning the wings are, are slightly above the, the flat plane. The last bird I'll feature here is the familiar turkey vulture. You can tell that by looking at its bald head, reddish head in the adults, and their two-toned underwings. Very dark bird on the body and the interior of the wing. Uh, the wing feathers, uh, flight feathers are lighter. 
and they, they fly with a strong V shape like this photo depicts. Um, and they do a lot of teetering back and forth and often are congregatory in groups. They're increasing almost as quickly as, as the bald eagles. So um, with that, uh, just give you a few more resources here to uh, check out the Hawk Watch and uh, learn about how the Harris Center is monitoring raptors. And with that, I think you are ready for some hawk watching and I'll leave the slide up so you can look at the resources as I take some questions. Great, Phil, there are some questions. Um, I wanna just start with one that came in from a fellow who lives in North Conway and he was curious if there's other areas across the state that are um, good for hawk watching like PAC and maybe have hawk watching people up there um, so you can go. Would you, mm. And I, I did put up the Hamana um, website that has you know sites listed but do you have any other suggestions, especially if you're from the North Country? Oh, yeah, that, that's that's a great question. And I, I wish I had time to detail all the different places that I would go. I have a, a, a list of places that I want to spend more time looking myself because I think there are some fantastic opportunities for seeing hawks up north. Um, Weeks State Park in uh, Lancaster on the other side of the Whites is, uh, is a well-known hawk watching spot that did have some coverage back in the 70s and 80s, I think. Um, in the Conway area, I would recommend, um, uh, I think Black Cap would be a good spot to check. And um, there are probably a few other hilltops that are just easy to get up to. That's basically the key. Find a spot that you can get to regularly and um, make it a habit of starting to watch. Yeah, I'm sure you'll see some migration there. I'll just add, you don't always have to be on top of a mountain. Just look up this time of the year and you can sometimes be surprised. I know in one of the schools that I work in, um, in a schoolyard, we just looked up and saw a kettle of broad wings. So, so keep your eyes on the sky. Um, thanks, Phil. I do want, before I forget, I just want to say that was fabulous. Everybody's saying how great it was. So, so much information. And there are some questions that um, people will just have to come and tune in on the November 3rd. 30th one that's raptors of the Monadnock region what we're learning from 5 30 to 6 30 will be on zoom and phil will be able to respond more to the questions about raptors that are declining but there was a question from steven and um he did mention he's playing the devil's advocate and i think this is a great question though but why should we be concerned about declining species what what's the what's what should we be thinking or what should we be concerned about why is this important yeah, well, it's a good question, and we have to be able to answer that. Um, I, you know, just each species, I think, has its own its own rights to exist. Um, is my personal philosophy. I know that's not everybody's, but um, you know, we uh, we try to minimize our impact. I think that's that's one of our our goals to be stewards of the natural world is to um, to, to mitigate the impacts that we know we have, and and you know, give every species a fair chance to exist. Um, for its ability to evolve and um, uh, you know have opportunities on, on their own, uh, but they also are are signs of health that relate back to us too. Um, the uh, these are are um, birds that that indicate a healthy environment and uh, are often looked to as uh, you know signals of change. If something is happening to to the birds, uh, you know potentially we're we're going to have we're going to see impacts. Uh, all across uh, the environment, including our own species. So we need to be concerned. And yeah, it, it's a good question uh, and a philosophical one, but I hope I, I answered that to your liking. <laughs> Can you, you add great, anything to that, Susie? No, you just did a great job, Phil. You, you nailed it. And I guess um, we are a little bit over time, so maybe you could just end. There's a couple of um, questions. So can you just remind everybody kind of the best time to go hawk watching and kind of the best... Um, let me just set the kind of the best time and the best way to see local migration mm -hmm. this time of the year. Give us some like fast tips as a, okay. an um, end point. Yeah, for hawks, I'd say, um, you know, get out uh, between mid-September and mid-October. Um, pick a day that's, um, you know, cool and, um, and wind is not too strong, but that there's some, you know, energy in the air. A little bit of a northern breeze is a good factor. Um, uh, pick a day where you have some contrast in the sky too. 
a blue sky day can be really challenging to see hawks migrating. Um, but you know, the higher you go, um, you know, you'll have a better opportunity to see them up on up on the mountain where we are. Um, so yeah, make a reservation though. Try to avoid the weekends if you do go to a busy site, uh, so you can have a better experience overall and and have a little more personal attention. Um, but yeah, just um, you know, wherever you are, I would say have a pair of binoculars handy and be ready to see migration. It's it's happening all around us. Uh, um, you don't have to be an early bird for hawks. That's good news about that. Uh, midday is is just fine if you spend a couple hours at it. You know, take your binoculars, take a field guide, and uh, yeah, do it with a friend or a family member. Thank you, and Phil. Kids. Bring a kid birding. Yeah, bring your kids birding. <laughs> and Phil, just thank you so much. I'm going to give a shout out to Phil's parents who are here just for raising such an incredible <laughs> human being and <laughs> such a talented teacher and educator. Um, so I'm just so thrilled that Phil is, is here in this world. So thank you to the Browns. Um, and thank you, Phil Brown, for sharing your expertise, your incredible knowledge, and your great tips. And thank you, everybody, for showing up tonight to learn about hawks and keep your eyes to the sky. 